first and foremost, what is canola oil? And you know, olive oil, I think most people know, it's sourced from olives. Uh, canola oil has a couple of different names that at least appear in the literature and perhaps on bottles in the, in the, in the store. So what is canola oil and, and ha- where is it sourced from? So it's sourced from a seed and they actually refer to the plant as rapeseed. Uh, and so that's the other common name you'll see is rapeseed oil. Uh, and the, the, the word rape there has nothing to do with the crime. It's actually uh, the, it comes from the Latin word for turnip because it's a relative of turnip and uh, Brussels sprouts and these, these brassica family plants. And so the original rapeseed oil wasn't used for, for food purposes because it was bitter and um, due to the content of erucic acid made it very bitter. And there was some evidence suggesting harm of erucic acid at high level. So what they did at some point was they bred this cultivar of the rapeseed plant where the seeds have a low content of erucic acid. And so that got rid of those problems. And then in Canada, initially, they they started calling it canola. It's a contraction of Canada, oil, low in acid. And that became popular in the U.S. now. It's often referred to as canola oil. In Europe, it's still referred to as rapeseed oil, even the the, the new version. Uh, In the U.K., I think they still call it rapeseed oil. Uh, In Scandinavia, there's a number of countries that... That use it interestingly in, in Scandinavia. There's a number of countries that use it, sort of like for Southern Europe, olive oil is the default. In Northern Europe, I think uh, rapeseed oil is the oil that they use for for, uh, for food. Uh, so yeah, you find these different names, uh, but that's essentially the uh, where it, where it's uh, obtained from, and then the the composition is essentially sixty something percent monounsaturated. A predominantly monounsaturated fat, seven percent saturated. Uh, the difference there with, with olive oil is olive oil is about seventy something mono, seven fourteen percent saturated, and then for polys is the rest. So twenty eight percent in the case of canola and twenty ish for olive oil. No, uh, less less probably around ten for olive oil for, for poofas. So it is. By classification, it comes from a seed, so it would fall into this umbrella uh, bucket of seed oils. But it, but in terms of fat profile, it's actually more like olive oil than it is to say soybean or corn or safflower oil, which are much lower in monounsaturated fats and contain quite a bit more omega six linoleic acid. Would that be accurate? Exactly. Technically, it's a seed oil, but. Uh, unlike most seed oils, it's much lower in linoleic acid. You mentioned that there was some selective breeding and that was done to make it a a healthier food product. I think you mentioned an acid there. I I forget the name that you used, but does that mean that this is erucic acid? Is that it? Yeah, yeah. Does that mean that it is genetically modified? Is it considered a, a GMO? So that initial breeding process was not GMO. It was just a natural breeding and selection. Nowadays, and actually this started uh, probably 20 years ago or so, they did develop a GMO version uh, for the purposes of, um, you know, to use pesticides, it's resistant to pesticides. So the Monsanto Roundup, this, it's resistance to, to glyphosate. So depending on the country and on the brand, there are GMO versions and non-GMO versions. But so, yeah, that initial process was not related to GMO, but they have come up with the GMO version of the seed. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. Do you know much about the processing? How the the seed is transformed into an oil or how the oil is extracted out and what is and, and perhaps isn't involved in that process? 
little bit. So, so there's basically two types, right? There's the refined type and the cold press type. And the main difference is the exposure to heat. So in the cold press, they grind it and extract the oil without the heat exposure. And then in the refined kind, which is the more, the more common, find, common type that you'll find in stores, um, there is a heating process, uh, there is a deodorization process, and they use these solvents, the hexane. Uh, so there is a number of additional steps to the, to the processing, to the, to the refining. And the, 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 the heating, I think, is probably the most relevant. The hexane, I think people ask questions about that as well, but, but heating would probably be the number one difference there. Yeah, based on my read of the, the claims that are made online from people who are of the view that canola oil is quote unquote toxic or harmful or something that we should minimize exposure to. It usually comes back to three or four things. And I think we've already hit on them. One is that it's a seed oil and by default it, it, it must be harmful, genetically modified. And then the processing. So the fact that there's deodorization, the involvement of hexane, that it's heated. Would you agree that this is the basis of, of most of the, the claims that exist or have you seen people also pointing to specific forms of, of evidence to kind of support the idea that canola oil is toxic? I think that's, that's pretty accurate. I think it all sits on the, the idea of it not being a natural thing, of it being in a, an artificial food. That, I think, is the basic idea, and it is very powerful uh, in terms of messaging, and I, would, and I wouldn't say that that's irrelevant either. And then I think most of these other concepts sit on it, the fact that it's refined, that there's hexane added, that, there, that it's heated, uh, the purification, all of this sits on this idea that it's an unnatural food, that our ancestors didn't need it, that it's new evolutionarily. It all stems from this idea of the what's natural and what's unnatural. Some people call it a naturalistic fallacy, but uh, the original concern, I think, is that. Uh, and then with the linoleic acid, I think there's, there's all these concerns with inflammation as well. There is this link to the biochemical pathway of linoleic acid being converted to arachidonic acid and so on to pro-inflammatory compounds, leukotrienes and prostaglandins and this, this kind of thing. So that's another uh, concern is that perhaps eating foods or a diet high in linoleic acid might lead to an elevation of these compounds, which then would lead to inflammation in the body. Right. And canola oil kind of enters that conversation because it it contains more linoleic acid than, say, olive oil or butter, even though it has less than some of the other seed oils, it's still considered to contain, I guess, an appreciable amount. Or if someone's taking that position that linoleic acid would increase inflammation, I assume that what they're saying is you could cook with better fats than canola oil that contain less linoleic acid, said differently. So what... What would you say, Jill, if, if someone said, look, I don't need any more information other than the fact that this is new, it's <laughs> ultra-processed, there, there may have been some um, selective breeding or GMO, it might be a GMO, um, there's, there's heating and deodorization and the use of these solvents like hexane, that's enough for me to know that this surely cannot be healthy. I don't need to be shown a meta-analysis or a bunch of meta-analyses or any studies. That's enough. Uh, at the level of individual choice, I don't, I don't think there's a problem there. If the person prefers or feels safer or feels more comfortable not consuming canola or, or, not, or not consuming any seed oils or any oils for that matter, some people prefer not to eat any oils at all and just get their fats from whole forms of, of whole foods. At a, as a, at a level of personal choice, I think that's completely fine. And it's not a problem nutritionally. You don't need canola oil in your diet. My concern is not that choice. My concern is basing firm beliefs on poor heuristics because sooner or later, you're going to make decisions that are detrimental or potentially detrimental. And in fact, we see plenty associated with these ideas of seed oils. 
When people say, I avoid seed oils, I don't see a problem. The problem is that the same influencers and the same logic then leads to making choices like, so instead of seed oils, I lather butter, butter and lard on everything. So you get to things, once you make one decision that's based on emotion or these kind of, these kind of one-liner first glance ideas that don't pan out scientifically in terms of the actual health effect of the foods, you're going to be more prone to make all kinds of decisions in a chain on that logic. And so, for example, swapping unsaturated fats for predominantly saturated fats, there's so much evidence stacked against that uh, in the long run. Uh, we're talking about substantial amounts, right? If, you're, if you have a little bit of butter and your lipids are good, whatever. But people being scared of unsaturated fats and eating a lot of butter and lard instead uh, in a Western population is going to be a terrible decision. Uh, but if they prefer olive oil, if they feel safer with olive oil or almonds or whatever, I don't see a problem. With that.